Okay. So we're going to start now. Hello, everybody. Um, just so you know, this event is is being recorded. And I've I've already mentioned that to you, so we're good. Anyway, good evening. My name is Margot Armstrong, also known by some of you as Jill, and I'm a longtime EAR board member and part of EAR's programming committee. First, I'd like to begin tonight in the spirit of respect, reciprocity, and truth by honoring and acknowledging Mokinsis and the traditional Treaty 7 territory and oral practices of the Blackfoot Confederacy, including the Siksika, Kenai, Bigani, as well as the Yasi, Nakoda, and Sutina nations. Ear acknowledges that this territory is also cherished by the Midi nations of Region 3, sorry, Nation of Alberta, Region 3, within the historical Northwest Midi homeland. We celebrate all nations, Indigenous and non, who honor this land. We're grateful to engage in an honest and eager process of reconciliation. We are all treaty people. On behalf of Elephant Artists Relief Society, also known as EAR and the EAR leadership team, I'd like to officially welcome you all to our event this evening, The Artist's Life. The Artist's Life is one of an ongoing series of EAR events called Umbrella Talks. EAR's primary purpose is to empower artists in Calgary and area to survive and thrive as artists. And these umbrella talks are one element of what we offer. This year, EAR celebrates 15 years of service to the local arts community. And even though EAR has grown and evolved over that time, our mission has remained the same, to provide practical resources that help sustain the livelihood and practice of artists in the Calgary area. To achieve this, EAR offers monthly professional and personal development talks, such as this one, a twice monthly online artist meetup group on Facebook called Studio E, a wide variety of community resource information, which you can find on our website, elephantartistrelief.com. And of course, our core program of emergency financial relief for artists who find them in a crisis, find themselves in a crisis situation. As a charitable organization, we rely on volunteerism, membership, and fundraising to do what we do. You can help us by raising awareness about EAR, and if you can, consider donating online. Our heartfelt thanks go out to all of those who've already gifted EAR in the past. The Society is 15 years old this year, and we are encouraging our supporters to contribute a monthly donation of $15 to mark this anniversary. Every dollar donated is allocated to providing relief for artists in times of need. So there's just one last bit of housekeeping throughout the presentation. We ask that you keep your mics on mute so there's minimal background interference. And please feel free to use the chat box to write your questions as they come up and we'll start to uh, a record of those for the Q&A portion of the evening after the presentation. Now, before I pass you along to Rachel Supersad, your host and moderator for the evening, I'll tell you a little bit about her. Rachel first served on the EAR board in 2011 to 2012. After almost a decade, she rejoined the EAR board in early 2021 and is the current president of the society. She is a Trinidad born Canadian immigrant, career arts administrator and public servant. She holds a BFA in fine art, a BA in art history with a minor in management and society and a postgraduate diploma in cultural resource management with specializations in collections management and cultural sector leadership. Rachel worked in arts and culture at the City of Calgary for more than 21 years and now spends her time on small consulting contracts 
managing her husband's mobile kiteboarding school and working for ear. So now without further ado, I will pass you along to Rachel Suprasad, who will introduce our speakers for this evening. Enjoy the evening, everybody. Thanks, Margo. Hi, everyone. I'm Rachel. Thanks so much for being here on this beautiful evening for our little chat. Um, we will keep things informal. So, you know, if you have a question that's burning, let us know. Otherwise, um, we do encourage you to write it in the in the chat and Margo will collect any questions that you have and we have a Q&A session towards the end where we'll you know be able to ask all these questions that we have. Um, hi Norman, thanks for joining us. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'll get started by introducing our guests. Uh, we have with us this evening Michelle Crush, Dean Berm, and Mindy Andrews. And I will start with Michelle. Michelle has worked professionally in film, television, and theater for more than 35 years. She's a multi-award winning actress who did her first film in Edmonton at the age of 17 called Isaac Little Feathers. Michelle has since dedicated her life to, change, to creating change for indigenous people through her work. Michelle is perhaps best known for her leading role as Gail Stoney in Blackstone, but other credits include her regular role in Sky Atlantic's drama Tin Star opposite Tim Ron, the popular APTN showcase series Moccasin Flats, and as Kate in the comedy hit Mixed Blessings. Michelle has, was also Sylvie Lebret in this hit CBC series, North of 60, and was recurring on CBC's Arctic Air. Her most recent work can be seen on CBC new, new, CBC's new limited series, Bones of Crows. Some of her feature film credits include, AKA Jimmy P, opposite Benicio Del Toro, Unnatural and Accidental, Pathfinder, don't Call Me Tonto, Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee, Dreamkeeper, and the recently released predator film, The Prey. Michelle says, one of her most memorable experiences was working opposite Johnny Depp and Gary Farmer in the feature film, Dead Man. <laughs> Michelle continues to write, direct, and produce theater and has played many leading roles across Canada. She tours extensively with her one-woman show, Inner Elder, which has been touring to sold-out audiences across Canada. Her community-based work with Indigenous youth and children is her greatest passion. Her two characters, Kuka Martha, a sprite Indian elder, and Majika, am I saying that one right? Majika, the Aboriginal healing clown, were developed to utilize comedy and hard-hitting truth to influence her audiences. Her most passionate work is in community, is in community. She is a founding member of Making Treaty 7, of the Making Treaty 7 Cultural Society, which is dedicated to indigenous artistic expression and exists to transfer indigenous knowledge through story and bring life to the promise of Treaty 7. Thanks so much for being with us, Michelle. It was awesome to read all of this. And then I went on Google and I Google all kinds of things to find out more about you. Um, I wanted to just start, since, since this is fresh and I've just gone through you know, your bio, maybe if you could just take a couple minutes to tell us, um, we know that you started, you know, your first film was at, at the age of 17. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about how you first got involved in acting? What spurred your passion for this field? And how long have you been supporting yourself with your practice? You might have to remind me of the last question. Okay. <laughs> but but um, Growing up here in Calgary, Alberta, I'm Cree. And um, there were not a lot of people that look like me on television. It wasn't like today with APTN and you know, there's indigenous visual art everywhere. It's, it's, a, it's a much different world than the world I grew up in. 
And the world I grew up in, when I could catch a glimpse of a real Indigenous person on um, TV, it would be such a, an exciting thing to see someone that looked like me because the world around me in Calgary didn't even look like me and I didn't get to see my cousins a lot. And uh, so back then Calgary was just very uh, majorly um, white. Mm-hmm. And I got a lot of bullying and a lot of racism in school. And I had this huge imagination. Um, and I think that I just knew that it could take me places because <laughs> I had to use it um, to uh, survive a lot of stuff growing up with both my parents being alcoholics and it was a lot of challenges going on in my home. And so I had this massive imagination and I would just you know, escape from the world. And then um, I got into high school and I met a man named Gordon Tatusis and he was a legend to me and he you know he'd only been in the business maybe six years but it was more than any other indigenous person I knew that was in the film industry so Gordon I said I want to be an actor but it just doesn't feel like there's um enough scripts out there or stories and he's like if you want to tell our stories you you have to do that this is a passion in you and you have to honor that passion and so he set me up with a um an agent in Vancouver people to call when I moved to Vancouver who helped me get an apartment in Vancouver and I was 19 and I'd already done a couple films. And uh, he really urged me to, to do it. And so I moved to Vancouver and then I, you know, suffered for many years because there were no indigenous scripts and I had to work in restaurants. But around 1992 was when um, Dances with Wolves came out and that's sort of the beginning of when indigenous film began to start creeping out. And um, yeah, so since then it's been pretty good in, uh, in, in the industry. And that's the reason I got into it was um, because I, I, my first, I first wanted to be at 16 to be a social worker so I could do something to help indigenous children. Cause I knew the way I grew up, no child should have to grow up like that. So I wanted to go to university and, and do that whole route until I met Gordon. And then I realized that acting had a much much bigger and profound effect on human beings than social work would and the power of the medicine that that we bring to stage or screen is just it's it's a beautiful thing because our our people watch and they see themselves and they learn how to heal Mm -hmm. and they learn about laughter and and reflections of who they are and then non-indigenous people can watch indigenous stories and and learn also about you know we're human right right long answer i'm sorry that's okay that's that's wonderful it's it's really intriguing and amazing to hear you talk about being a part a part of such change over your career and to be able to witness that and see that that's pretty awesome yeah yeah i just want to add that what you just said is i was just talking about this with my workmate neil fleming um Prior to COVID, you know, before, like my, my generation came in after, you know, Cantu and Graham Greene and Gary Farmer and Gordon and August Schellenberg and Chief Dan George. Like that was, that was the first um, ones that came through the doors, right? Back in the 70s and 80s. And then my generation came up after that with, you know, Jen Podemski and there was just a whack of us that came through that door that they kicked down. And 30 years, you know, we've been discussing uh, diversity and representation in film and, you know, lobbying and, and creating awareness about having more Indigenous stories on the screen. And then COVID happened and we came to the standstill and people began to listen a bit more to each other. And so I was telling Neil the other day, I said, 30 years of investing in this business and now we're having a payoff. Mm-hmm. Now the younger actors are not in the same situation that we were in. And there's just this, you know, beautiful explosion of indigenous storytelling happening now. And it's like, you know, Dean was saying it's, he's ridiculously busy and that's how I feel too. It's like project to project to project plus running, you know, the vision of Nick and Treaty 7 is, it's a lot happening, but we've invested so much into that and now it's paid and I love it. That's wonderful. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks for the, talking us through that because we, we need to hear that too, right? To recognize the change that's happening. Yeah. 
it's big. Big. It's huge. Thanks. Okay, Mindy, you are next on my list. Okay. So, Mindy Andrews, nature has always played an important role in Mindy's life and her work. Since graduating from Alberta University of the Arts in 2002, she has developed a line of porcelain work that incorporates carved pattern or brushwork designs based on naturally occurring motifs such as trees, leaves, and flowers. I, I pulled this expert excerpt off of her artist statement on her outdated website, she will admit to. Uh, trees have always inspired my imagination. My playground growing up was the idyllic set setting of Northwestern Ontario, situated on 98 acres surrounded by crown land. I continue to love the smell, texture, and light created by a magnificent forest. Though through the use of porcelain clay, I'm able to create beautiful light and depth. Sometimes I will carve the trees to suggest the texture of the bark. My pieces are sometimes functional, while others are more sculptural. Mindy launched Mayview Studio in 2005, converted her garage into a home studio, and since then she's had her work selected for numerous exhibitions in Calgary, Edmonton, Waterloo, London, New York, San Francisco, Chicago, Australia, and South Korea. Mindy is represented by galleries across Alberta in Calgary, Black Diamond, High River, Waterton, and as well as galleries in BC and Ontario and south of the border in Florida. More recently, Mindy entered into a new venture with her lifelong creative collaborator, Lisa McGrath, with whom she started Bramble Studio. For the past decade, Mindy has shared her passion for ceramics with others as both an instructor and a ceramics technician at the city's two art centers. So full disclosure, Mindy and I went to art school together. And so I know her work really well. I know Mindy as a, as a colleague and as a friend. Um, and I also wanted to share some of Mindy's work with you before I let her speak. Okay. Let her work kind of speaks to who she is. So I'm going to attempt to share my screen, which works sometimes and it doesn't work sometimes. Here it goes. Give me a thumbs up. Okay, great. So this is uh, this is Mindy's website, and I'm just going to file through some of the images so you get to have a sense of the work that she creates. So you can see the nature reflected in it. This is one of those porcelain pieces that is the porcelain allows the light to shine through, which is an amazing effect. And this is Bramble Studio. And this is the kind of collaborative work that you can see this is Mindy's work on the right and Lisa's work on the left and the combined work in the middle. Yeah. So I'm gonna stop sharing now and Mindy. Yes, Rachel. <laughs> um, I happen to know that you did not begin your career as a ceramist. And we both met at ACAD as mature students. And by mature, I just mean not straight out of high school. Um, so tell us a little about how you first got involved in the arts. What spurred your passion for ceramics? Um, and how did, you, how did you end up in this particular career? Yes, yeah, so I guess to start the story off, uh, my husband was doing uh, graduate studies at UBC, going into library science. And at the time, I thought I had all the qualifications to become a dental hygienist. 
So I thought I was doing that, but on the side, I was always painting or drawing. I've always done that. I really missed, as you mentioned, our property in Northwestern Ontario, it's sort of where I grew up. And now I'm in the big city in Vancouver, escaping to the forest and drawing while thinking, oh yes, money, money's important, yes. So I will go and do uh, dental school. So I did hygiene first. Schooling was, was great but then actually doing it <laughs> nine to five job in an office. Um, I'm glad that I, I, I did that first instead of thinking I wanted to become a dentist because no, I didn't. Um, my husband had completed his master's in library science and uh, we were coming back this way. I was doing a little bit of work in the dental field and uh, I said to George, I can't do this. And he said, well, what do you want to do? And his background was music. And I said, I need to go to art school. And he said, of course you do. Well, let's do it. So that's what I did. I uh, went to Red Deer College first, thinking I was gonna be a painter. And then I took an elective, which was clay, and I loved it. Not only like from, from the beginning, from this block of clay, but you got to play with fire and chemicals and all kinds of cool stuff. <laughs> So that was that. And then I decided I'll get my degree. So I, I uh, went to University of the Arts and that's where I met you and got my degree and uh, never looked back. Uh, it was the best decision I ever made. So yeah, yeah, coming at it at a little bit older, I was there to absorb and take what I wanted and then get out. <laughs> right, right. That's awesome, amazing. I think you've had an amazing career and it's been a pleasure to follow and watch. Oh, thanks. Do your thanks. Stuff. Do your thing. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. And for sharing me. your work. Oh, thank I you. will move on to Dean. Dean, sir, I'm going to again try to share my screen and I'm going to play a little short video that I found online today. Um, it's it's going to be silent while I read Dean's. Um, bio for everyone so because I enjoyed it so much I think I want to share it mm. okay do you see my screen thumbs up if you do awesome yeah yeah good okay so we're going to meet Gustavo in this so Dean is the artistic director and co-founder of Green Pools Theatre. He began his studies as a sculpture major and performance artist at the Alberta College of Art and Design, and then attended the Dell, Dell Art School of Physical Theatre in Blue Lake, California. For the last 30 years, Dean has been delighting audiences across the globe with his buffoonery, clowning, and stilt characters his alter ego, Gustavo the Impossibilist, is infamous, world, infamous worldwide, and this is who we're seeing on screen. Okay. Dean has performed and taught physical theatre workshops across Canada, Europe, South America, Macedonia, New Zealand, Japan, and the USA. He has taught social circus to tens of thousands of youth all across Canada and in Lesotho, South, America, South Africa. He has performed as a clown with Cirque du Soleil at the Luminato Festival in Toronto, as a puppeteer with the Calgary Philharmonic Orchestra, and with the National Theatre Orchestra in Ottawa. Recently, Dean has been acting in TV and creating public television shows for kids, and is a puppeteer on the new Fraggle Rock, Back to the Rock on Apple TV, and on Joe Pickett on Paramount Plus. So I uh, will let you finish off this. Ah, <laughs> uh, Gustavo. <laughs> that was Gustavo. Awesome. Okay, so Dean, you started out studying sculpture. So can you please tell us? a little about how your interest in performance became the focus of your career. What spurred your passion for this field? 
Well, in fact, um, it started earlier than art college uh, in high school. I had a really amazing teacher named Gary Stromsmo, who was a uh, pretty edgy kind of performer, or like a, a teacher who did a lot of really cool stuff. So it just exposed me very early on when I first got into the arts. Like I always knew I was a bit of an artistic kid. I was also a lot of trouble. I grew up in I grew up in Ogden here in Calgary. I happened to live in Ogden, but I grew up in this when it was a time when it was kind of a rough neighborhood. Um, uh, and so uh, I sort of found a, I found an outlet for my my destructive natures as a child. Um, and so I ended up doing drama in school. I did, the, you know, as soon as I got into junior high school and then high school, I did theater. And then, um, after high school, for some reason, I went to art college. I just thought, you know, I, I really want to try graphic arts. I'm also a very visual, I was always a visual artist person. So I went to art college, um, when it was still ACA, um, uh, before it had a degree program or anything like that. And so I, I started doing lots of different things. I, uh, in my second year, I double majored in uh, textiles and, um, and sculpture and, um, and, and I tried everything there. I, I loved art college. It was just such an amazing time for me as an artist to realize you can do anything. You make anything. You can, you know, there's all these amazing me mediums and materials. Um, and so I, I did that. Uh, and then about my third year, I started doing a lot of performance artwork. Um, and I had done some performance artwork in high school and I started doing performance art. I, I looked at a lot of artists that I was sort of respected that were coming like to the late seventies, early eighties and stuff. I looked at some of that stuff that was happening. So I started doing these crazy mud performances at our art college. Um, I was known as the mud man for a long time. I made a lot of mess in that art college. I put piles of dirt everywhere in that school. The janitors hated me. Um, but uh, so I had a really uh, productive time, but after about my third year, I realized, okay, maybe, I need to get more of a performative kind of education. So I actually left our college in my third, after my third year, before going into my fourth year. And I went to the Dolarte School of Physical Theater in Blue Lake, California, which is a clown school, um, started by a guy named Carlo Mazzoni Clemente. And I studied at that school. I learned mime, I learned mask, I learned clown. I learned all of the sort of physical theater stuff. Um, and a lot of these are, a lot of my teachers had studied with like Gaulier and Lecoq. So I was learning sort of uh, real traditional European style clowning and stuff like that. So then I did two years down there, studied a lot of masks, puppets, mythology, all that kind of stuff, and came back to Calgary, 91, started The Green Fools with Christine Cook. And, and, and that's then now, and here we are three years later. Um, we started as like a small artist. We, you know, we were always connected to the arts. That's why I've, I've known about ear since the beginning. And we've always been really connected to artists using visual artists, graphic artists, theater artists. It's one of the things about the fools is we've always been an incubator for the creative nature of the arts. And we don't, we've never separated. We don't separate. We're just doing stage work and we only do theater craft. We do masks, we do puppets, we do um, stilt walking characters. And so we sort of made a name for ourselves doing all this different kind of work. Um, we started doing, like I say, at festival, Michael Green, for example, we started doing, I just started doing performance art pieces at the High Performance Rodeo, 92, 93. They let me put mud into the secret theater. Um, um, you know, so Michael was a really huge incubator in terms of saying, hey, look, you guys, I've got something that nobody else is doing, and 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 the rabbits had done some still walking. and said, "Take over these still gigs." So Michael actually got us our first still gig, which became sort of now is one of our main staples of our company, where we do a lot of festivals and events. You'll see the Green Fools there. We've worked all across the globe doing that stuff. At the same time as we were working with the Fools, we were creating theater shows because we've always been a theater company as well. And so we we would create shows, puppet shows, mass shows that would then tour, and we would tour the fringe circuits. Um, somewhere around 94, 95, all those young guys that started with the Trouts, Judd Palmer and um, uh, uh, P2 and all these, all these guys, they kind of joined the Green Fools. They just fresh out of university, they joined Green Fools. We created some shows together with them. We created Ben Benito Cellini and Ice King and some amazing programming. And then they split off because they, they wanted to keep doing more, fa more adult stuff. We decided we were gonna keep doing more family stuff um, and keep that, we, we always had a Halloween party we always had an April Fool's Day event. So the Green Fools have been, as a nonprofit society, we just sort of grew. And then we became a charity in 97. And uh, and we started doing 
somewhere in around 2000, just before 2000, because um, I've been doing street performing. I'm also a street, uh, Gustavo, the character that you saw there is a street performer. Um, and so I did a lot of street festivals all around the world. I traveled probably the most with Gustavo, doing thousands and thousands of shows for lots of people all around the world. I did the Glastonbury Festival. I did Edinburgh. I did a lot of stuff in Europe. Um, where I really honed my craft as a street performer. And we brought that back to Canada, and then we started doing more festivals doing that. So we started doing street performers festivals and folk festivals and kids festivals. And then we started doing circus. We started doing social circus somewhere around, like I say, nine, you know, 2000. Uh, a friend of mine, Neil Rempel, who runs the Winnipeg Children's Festival, he's like, hey, I want to do this camp for kids in inner city Winnipeg. So we, a bunch of his friends, street performer friends, we all gathered together and did these amazing camps for kids. And that just inspired me so much that I started doing programs here as well. So I still do that camp every year for the last 30 years I've been doing that that camp in Manitoba. Now we go to a rural community up in the north. Um, and as the company grew, we started doing more of that work. We started doing social circus. We started getting funding for social circus. We started working with indigenous youth. Uh, we started working with a lot of new immigrants and refugee youth. And we started working with, you know, a real wide variety of, of kids and just started working with you know, in schools and doing festivals and um, um, then doing workshops in schools and doing workshops at festivals and really bringing people and trying to bring community together. And so we kept doing that. And now, just before the pandemic started, the Green Fools opened our very own circus school. We wanted to start trying to provide a place where kids could come and take classes on a regular basis, uh, where we can have ongoing social circus programs and hopefully that our, our paid for classes will help sponsor them non non paid for classes because a lot of these programs uh tens of thousands of kids have taken our programs for free and really and then i started working with Cir i worked with cirque du soleil i started doing a lot of outreach work in northern canada i worked up in inuvik and in nunavik and northern quebec and all these uh, indigenous communities and uh doing circus uh and so fast we're st every all during all this time we're still creating theater shows we're still producing puppets we're still making things and now we're part of an organization called circus kina and we're doing a national circus approach using social circus as an intervention tool for youth at risk and we are doing exchanges with kids we're taking kids from calgary to uh, different communities and and uh really trying to make sort of more of a national approach to this um and we continue to do that so and then more recently because of the pandemic i have got a bunch of television work uh jim henson company came here and um and uh, fraggles fraggle rock came here and i managed to get on that show and do that which was a bucket list to check off i mean I'm so excited to work for the hensons and that was an amazing experience and because of that experience i got some more work on doing television work so i've come into television a little bit later in my life but I like it, <laughs> Michelle. I like the money. <laughs> it's great <laughs> getting TV stuff, um, and I'm, I, you know, so I and I, I always love. I've watched um, Michelle's career, and and I've actually worked with her daughter. Imagine was a puppeteer in one of our shows. So we've done a lot of work where we try to bring kids and youth together to try to match them with professionals, work with artists on the circus level and on a on a physical theater level. So that's masked, mime, clown, circus. So. Yeah, I think that's uh, that sort of sums it up where we are today. <clears throat> wow, <laughs> that's a lot. <laughs> Thank you yeah. so much. Yeah, you've, you've done amazing things over the time, for sure. Um, so it, it's interesting. I'm just going to make a, a, a brief comment on some of the similarities that I heard from all three of you. Um, I heard that there was a really important person in your life that, you know, kind of helped at the beginning to kind of spark, you know, moving forward. There was someone who, you know, it either opened some doors or made things possible, seem possible to, to encourage you to keep going. Um, also that you've all kind of started things yourself. Like you started your own, you know, you started a company, you started a studio, you started a business, whatever, you know, that you, you um, figured that, that that was something that you needed to do and, and you all managed to do that as part of your career as well. Um, so it's, it's really interesting to listen to three people from completely different backgrounds doing different kinds of work, but you know, that important person and then the, the drive to, to start something for yourself. That's, that's really cool. 
So another question that I have on my list is, um, can you give, give us an example of an important lesson about being an artist that you did not learn in school? Uh, you kind of learned along the way, something that is really important to someone who is maybe thinking about a career um, as an artist, but it's, it's just not something that they're going to learn. It kind of came to you through experience. Can you think of something like that that you could share? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, lesson I didn't learn in school. Well, I would say business acumen is something that I didn't really learn in school, unfortunately. I mean, I think maybe it's better now. Uh, at the time, uh, it was like, just, you know, just paint, 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 paint. Uh, just do your thing. And I, and I get that. At the same time, uh, business acumen is, is really important. We decided early on from a very early right after our college and school that we should start a nonprofit because we knew that that would um, give us the accessibility to funding models. It also gave us a little bit of support structure in terms of board. And um, I mean, that's not for everyone. I know, you know, nonprofits um, also have their drawbacks, but um, that's sort of like, so I think that and that notion of it's not bad to make money. It's not dirty to do some work that maybe isn't necessarily your main passion. Maybe you're not making the most beautiful work, but sometimes I would go do a gig at a bat mitzvah because I needed to pay the rent that month. Or sometimes I would have to go, I would go busk on the street. I, uh, I wasn't too um, proud to go, I'm going to go out on the street, take my craft there and learn on the street and realize you can make a lot of money doing street performing. Actually, it's a really great profession and the guys that I do know that are serious at still doing it are making a lot of money. So it was, I think it was more like um, getting out there and just sort of not you know just being open to different avenues i think is what the biggest thing that i didn't learn because i think in school quite often they want you to they want to you're a painter now you're a painter mm. uh, or you're a sculptor and sculptor. and if you have that craft and you're really good at it like mindy all you have to do is just really get good at that craft and i and it was the same thing for me it was like just be good at your craft more than anything, be good at your craft. Yes, there's going to be lots of competition. There's going to be a lot of people that come up and start trying to do the same thing that you're doing. But as long as you're good at your craft and you just keep on the keep on track, I tell you this all the time. Just stay focused. Just find your passion and do that. So I mean, I, I would say that's one of the biggest things I learned from outside of schooling was love what you do so that you you do it well and and just keep doing it well and just you know get better at your craft. It's not going to happen to you know. So. Yeah, uh, Cindy, I saw you nodding a lot. Yeah, I was just yeah, just carry on, right, Jean and Michelle. Yeah. I mean, and I would say in art school, you explore and you try different materials and you play. And not to say I still don't do that, but there are things like to pay the bills that I I make, mm -hmm. and it's we call the, I won't say it, the, the shitty bits, the bits, you know, which are mugs. I mean, they, they sell quite easily. Money makers. Money <laughs> it's makers. your money maker. There we go. We call them the poopy bits. But yes, they're not poopy, but, you know, we're just being silly about it. But those things do have to be made, right? And um, you try and change and it. And it's not the sacrifice. It's not to like, I, I don't think it's a never, it's never sacrificing your art, but I'm, maybe Michelle, yeah. you've, maybe you've done roles where you were like, yeah. eh, this wasn't, this maybe wasn't the best thing that I wanted to do, but you know, it helped me pay the rent that month. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, as I said, I got to put the bum pants on again. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> Getting to that point in my career is like, how long can I put those bum pants on, you know? Right, right. But so being it's the right thing. You know. what it takes to pay the bills right yeah. that's yeah. an important thing yes yeah yeah Alex, do you have a comment on this one yeah. Sorry. um yeah there's been a few projects i've um, i've never watched in my life that i've been on and i won't and i'm embarrassed if anyone asks me about them <laughs> for sure <laughs> um but i was thinking about what you were saying um like something that you've learned in your career that you didn't know when you were starting out. 
-hmm. And um, I guess I would have to say, um, because it's such a grind and a hustle. And I raised two children in this as a single mother also. (laughs) Thank God I had my parents to help me with the girls when they were little. But um, something I did learn is um, not to sit around and wait for the work to create it. And so I've been, yeah, I've, Mm -hmm. I've often created one woman shows and I did it always without grants from Canada Council or anything like that. I just created them, rehearsed them in my house and then, you know, picked up the props and made my wardrobe and then, you know, started marketing it to communities or places. So yeah, that to me, um, I've always got, I had a whole bunch of things that I would have up my sleeve of how to make money through creative expression. So that's where Majika came from, the, the, um, the clowning work I do with uh, three to six-year-olds on reserve. And, uh, and Cooka Martha, who's my comedy character, and I've been traveling with her for 30 some years. And she came from me going, okay, um, of course, I, you know, I also feel like I channeled these characters, right? Like that's a whole other conversation, <laughs> but I opened up the door to them because I had to make money. And so that was a big thing for me was just learning how to adapt when the roles weren't there on film and uh, yeah, learning how to um, plan ahead. It's always about planning, you know, your gigs ahead of time. I'm past that part of my life, thank God. (laughs) But I spent many years um, just constantly go, go, go and booking three, three months ahead of time speaking in communities or whatever it was just you can't rely on one one discipline i couldn't no um so all three of you have you know been based in calgary for your career i've worked with a lot of artists who chose to leave calgary um for various reasons uh but mostly because they you know saw greener pastures elsewhere i guess um, what are your thoughts? Can you share a bit about specifically being an artist in Calgary? Why did you choose to stay? Because it's a choice. Um, and, and, you know, do you have thoughts about, was it, you know, more challenging? Did you make a decision that you wanted to stay here and do this work in this city? Um, any, any comments from you on that? Because I think that, you know, the, th- the three of you have, have built your career here, which is, which is pretty phenomenal and wonderful for our community. Mindy, did you want to start? Yeah, sure. Michelle. Could you see my eyes going yes, yes? <laughs> <laughs> I, I came here because my husband was from here. We were living in Vancouver. We moved back because his mom was getting on in age. So went to school here, set up shop, and it's the landscape is beautiful. The city, you know, wherever you are, cities have issues, you know, there's always something good and bad. I think here the city wasn't too big. Um, and I could, but I could still reach a bigger audience, a bigger world world by by sending work to other places so i guess my roots started here because i own everything <laughs> you know yeah i mean that's a simple answer yeah now i'm here yeah i love it here um, well all career i i was born and raised here this is where my family's from um my ancestors are from here, Métis, and my grandmother, and and just I have a long roots in this location, and mm-hmm. I feel very um, very connected to this land. At the same time, don't get me wrong, there wasn't times in the '90s when I was over in Europe going, oh, I could just stay here and do really well here. But I think what for the Green Fools, for me, it was like my baby was born here. It was like the Green Fools was this thing I was so passionate about. Uh, in this city, in this, in this territory, with this, this land, where I feel connected, and um, and my family's here, my family all lives here. 
Um, we never left. Um, and I traveled the world. I went and came back. But I always realized that we are here in Calgary. I feel like we're kind of big fish in a smaller pond. Whereas mm -hmm. I knew other people who are in other bigger cities where, you know, you're, there's many, you know, like you go to Montreal and there's, you, you, you can't swing a juggler without hitting an aerialist. There's so many different people. Whereas here, we were kind of niche. And now we're not as much. But what we've done is we've actually created, I feel like, for example, puppets. Not like we're the first people to do puppets. Ronnie Burkett was here before us. But with the Green Fools have been here as a puppet company for many, many years. And we've had a lot of people that work with us, a lot of people that went and started their own things. We started the Chaos Animated Objects Festival. When Christine um, left the company, she, she did the festival. And so we, you know, we've been so integrated in terms of trying to build our legacy here. I'm at that point now where I'm, I'm really, the legacy, the notion of legacy is something that's really important to me. And I don't want the mm -hmm. fools to die. When I'm, to, you know, in 10 years, when I'm done putting on the bump pants, I want someone else to take this over. And I want to, I'm proud of who we are and what we've done in this city because let's face it this is a very conservative province we've have you know we've had a, a real uphill battle to try to get indigenous recognition and rights and, and and artists getting recognized and i think we're coming you know like it feels like eventually this will change but there's got to be someone here to, to fight the good fight we have yes. to, everyone goes away you know it's like there's no one left here to fight the good fight so we still do that we stay, you know we really try to stand up for for us, and now with the kids that we work with, a lot of the youth that we work for, I'm working with new, you know, indigenous youth and new refugee youth who need a, they need a grounding here. They need to feel like there's something in this city mm -hmm. for them. And so that's what we're trying to do. That's what the school is about. It's like trying to, I'm, so I'm proud to be from Calgary. I mean, I, and people go, oh, you're from Calgary. Oh, I'm so sorry. And it's like, <laughs> you know what? Like we've done very well. And I, and we've been, and we've been very supported by our community because they recognize the work that we do. So I cannot, mm -hmm. that's why I'm, I'm making a living being an artist is because, because I stayed and I didn't go someplace else. I stayed here and I stuck to my guns and, you know, and then when, People, companies like Fraggles come, they go, oh, we're looking for the puppet people. Ha ha, I happen to be, I'm a puppet person, <laughs> you know, like, so I think it's part of, part of the growth of a, of a, of a community to mm -hmm. be some part of it, to be part of it, yeah. Wonderful. Thank you for sticking around because, you know, sticking around means that you, you change the city. You change the city with the work that you do, right? And I like, I like your point about legacy. I think that's, that's huge because you need artists to stick around and keep the work happening and keep it consistent to create change and create that legacy. So thank you from Calgarians. <laughs> Michelle, do you have thoughts about, um, you know, being an artist, a performer, an actor, an actress in Calgary specifically? Um, I've spent, <clears throat> I spent an early part of my career in Vancouver. I spent seven years out there and that was the choice I had to make because there wasn't a lot of film in Calgary back then. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Choking. <coughs> um, and then I moved to Toronto for a while and did that whole scene out there, got more into theater out there. Mm -hmm. But I, I chose to come home. And there's something about this land here and the prairies and especially where the mountains and the prairies meet that foothills, like it's magic. My family's from Maple Creek, Saskatchewan, and it's only four hours away. So it's always my whole life. I've gone back and forth down that number one highway and seen the progression of the land and, you know, right to the Cypress Hills. It's the land that keeps me here. It, it's, uh, it's just so magic. And you can like, especially during COVID, I was like going to parks everywhere, just getting out of the city and driving and discovering more places that I'd never been before. And um, yeah, I love it. I love Southern Alberta. I, living in the mountains, I get claustrophobic, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I always need that open, beautiful prairie sky. And making Treaty 7 is a huge part of the land too. I mean, that the stories we, we you like the stories we tell on stage is all about the land and the history here. Um, so just switching gears a little bit, um, you spoke, all of you spoke of, uh, met, you know, I talked about you starting, starting things. And then you talked about, you know, making opportunity for yourself. So if you don't see the work there, you, you make the work, you do something for yourself. Um, 
Can you talk a little bit about, and we talked about, you know, business acumen not being taught in school, um, but you really do have to have that as an artist working as well. Do you consider yourselves to be obviously artists first, but also an entrepreneur, you know, a sole proprietor, a business person, these are these are skills that you that you have, right? That you have to have in order to, to do the work that you do. And it's important. I, I don't have those skills, so good for no. you, Dee. <laughs> I'm like so not business minded. Everything I see is in a performance. <laughs> okay, I just have, I like it. Yeah, <laughs> right. I like it. Yeah. Um I mean Personally, for the fools, I mean, I what I have tried to do over the last thirty years is try to get myself out of that as much as possible. So trying to trying to be able to get to that place where I only have to think about the art and not have to about what's you know and booking the gigs and also getting volunteers for the casino and but 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 that's I mean that's the nature of our business. We've we're all hands on deck um, mm -hmm. in our company. Green Fools, everybody's a little bit of something. So, so I'm still involved in negotiations. I'm still involved in some grant writing. I'm still involved in, um, quite often I'll go in to, to talk to clients, to be the person, the spokesperson, the face of the, of the programs, because I have the most, you know, I can, I'm very passionate about it and I can make sure to convey that. But yeah, I think, um, it's one of, it's a necessary evil. It'd be awesome if we could just all just someone would just do all that stuff for us <laughs> but like as you say michelle you got to get creative you got to write your own stuff and you produce your stuff so um you know i like i said ultimately i'd like to get to a point right now we're, we're producing a, a puppet television show and so i'm really trying to let go of certain things let's hire a graphic artist it's just going to do the graphics i'm not going to try to do everything because you know but but yeah, you have to be well versed in many different things. So you're gonna learn how to use an Excel spreadsheet, even though I'm terrible at it. Still, <laughs> still terrible at it. But you know, um, I think it's important that artists. I think that one of the main things is that artists really need to take themselves seriously, and mm -hmm. and 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 really recognize what your work is worth. I mean, that's something that we've just constantly had a problem with where you're, you know, people are trying to talk you down in price and stuff, and, you know, and this happens to us all the time in events. Oh, there's going to be great exposure. You know, you get that line all the time. It's like people die of exposure. No, I mean, there, uh, yes, exposure is great, but at the same time, we are paying our artists, you know, it, I go back to the corporate client con contract where you're, you know, they're trying to undervalue you. Oh, I want you to come paint at our come paint at our event, come make your ceramics at our event. Would you come and do some storytelling at our event? Uh, and we're gonna, you know, we'll, we'll pay you this little tiny honorarium, but we're gonna spend $1,200 on balloons. And it's like, I'm kind of like, people aren't gonna remember your balloons. So it's about also having kind of confidence in yourself as an artist to recognize what, what your worth is. And we constantly tell this to new artists all the time that come in and lower the bar down in terms of that kind of business level, it's like, look, you can walk on stilts, but don't charge $50 an hour for what you do because you learned a skill and not anyone, no one else can do that skill. And you know, you, you're a juggler. You should get paid. You've learned how many years of your life did you spend learning juggling? Get paid for it. Don't undersell yourself on that stuff. So we're very much about same thing about artists and paintings, you know, like oh, I charge this much per square foot. I have so many artists. I'm like, why are you not charging more? How long did you go to school for? How much did you pay to go to for school for that thing? Somebody wants that, they'll pay the price. Don't give that stuff away. You know, if you're gonna make a, if you want to make a product that's like, okay, these are really easy and cheap to make, and I can sell these for ten dollars each. Great. I know a lot of artists that do that as well, that are versatile. Great. Have that body of work, but you know, don't undervalue the work. It's a constant problem. For yeah. Us, you know, constant problem. Yeah, I concur with that, Dean. Yeah, it's always uh, not an issue, but a definite sort of. Um, thing that just occurs all the time, like pricing work and where, where, uh, or how you educate people that are purchasing the work. It's why is this, this, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. It's, it's ongoing, but then it's also, well, if this isn't, isn't your cup of tea, then, you know, there are other people that you can go and look at. And, yeah. And it's also, I think, you know, it's funny as, as we've always looked at it as a way of educating our audience as well. Yeah. 
really trying to educate our audience and not just our audience, our funders, our, mm -hmm. um, give us, yeah. you know, the funders for nonprofits or you try to write a grant and try to convince them that, and I think the funders are starting to get it now. They're starting to understand more now that you don't, you don't, don't ask for $10,000 and say, I'm going to put on a whole production. You know, it's like, you might be able to do that, but you're not getting paid when you do that. So, you know, um, yeah. uh, so, and then, you know, it's just that thing of like, you know, make sure that you value the worth of what you've put behind this thing. Um, um, and, you know, and I, I think, that, I think that comes with maturity as an artist, as a, somebody more confident about your work. Mm -hmm. But I think sometimes the mistake is when you're first trying to get into the business, you'll just do whatever for anybody, for anything. Mm -hmm. And, and I've seen street performers that do that. Guys who like, they'll just, they'll, they want to charge $1,500 for a corporate show, but then tomorrow you'll see them on the street doing street performing. And it's like, okay, well, you know, that, that guy can pay you for free over here, but now you're not going to get any work for $1,500 for a corporate gig. Sorry, because if they can see you outside for free. So it's that trying to find that balance between your art and, and, um, and where, and where is your venue, what you want to, where you want to be and where you want to be working. I mean, um, yeah, like I say, like Michelle, the more TV work you can get, right? But it is a, it's a brutal industry. That is a brutal industry. I've auditioned for so many things this year. So many. I've never auditioned before so much. And I'm not getting, you know, then you get like, I got a Kevin Sorbo movie or, you know, you get some other silly, stupid thing. But, you know, you, you, you okay, this will eventually, I'll, maybe I'll find my place here or I got to get older or more character looking. Um, but yeah, um, I know I went off tangent. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. M Michelle, what about you in, in your area? You said you don't really have those business skills, but I mean, you've done one woman shows that you create on, on your own and then you, you tour them. So what would you say it takes to do that? If not, you know, entrepreneurial skills. That's why they're one woman shows. <laughs> <laughs> it's just me that I have to worry about. Everything's on tape. No. Um, <laughs> um, I try to stay away from that stuff, to be honest with you. If I can take care of my own financial needs, I'm good. <laughs> and my daughters, you know, like our home. Um, but I, I try not to have to deal with money. Like right now with Making Treaty 7, Neil Fleming, who's the executive director, he's always like, don't worry about things. Go create. And that is such a freaking luxury. Right. And such a beautiful you know this we have a show coming up here in September and I've never in my life felt so supported in doing something so it for me it's about having the right people around you <laughs> I can help you because I don't even write grants you know like I'm not a grant writer I I am I'm a creator and you know I hire someone they can take 10 percent of the grant but <laughs> I'm not gonna write it <laughs> I'm a horrible AD, aren't I? No. No, no, but I think you're right. I think that's a great, that's great uh, lesson, Michelle. And I, and I've said that for years, surround yourself with people who are better at the stuff than you're not good at. Like, I'm not a mather. Keep me away from money. Do not me let too. me deal with that at all. <laughs> yeah. Just pay me and let someone else deal with that stuff. But that's, you know, that really is the truth. We just surround yourself with people. It, you know, as you grow, as an individual artist is different. You know, you, 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 you find, um, you know, agents or you find partners or like Ian, yeah. You know, yeah taking care of that stuff yeah. yeah i would say like for myself having started bramble studio which is an online platform for selling work i connected with lisa mcgrath who i work with and is a great friend and also a fellow ceramicist so we can support each other in this adventure to the online selling and everything. Uh, yeah, so it's similar to both of you, uh, making sure you have people around you. Yeah, support and help out. So I'm guessing that at some point things, um, you know, were a bit tough at <laughs> some point. Um, what, did, did you, any of you ever think about giving it all up? Throwing it in, you know, doing something else. Many and if so, how come you didn't do that? You I'll jump in on this one. <laughs> oh, man. As an actor, there's been many times where I haven't gotten a role in a while. And I just think the worst things of myself. I'm just like, you're 
you're a horrible actor and you'll never you'll never get a job again and it's time to quit this and become a waitress <laughs> i don't know how to do anything else anyways um i yeah i've been at that place many times and i have a one woman show called in your elder and i talk about this one time in my life that um growing up as i mentioned earlier both my parents were alcoholics and i it's a comedy about my life and one of the things that um i talk about is uh I studied alcoholism closely as a child. Like I studied it very close with my mom and dad and my aunts and my uncles and my grandparents and my whole family was afflicted with this disease. And I grew up and I never became an alcoholic, which, you know, a lot of my family still suffers with this, but there was a part of me that went to acting and, and it just changed my whole life. Like my, the, the, what I feel through me when I'm in the middle of a, you know, those, beautiful moments of transferring that medicine it's just it it shifts who I am but anyways in my one woman show I talk about um when my daughters were little they're now 22 and 19 but when they were little girls and I had just left their dad um we you know we lived out in Sutina for a long time and then we moved to the city and that's when I left him and I struggled, I struggled. And it was so hard because people already knew me as, you know, Sylvie Lebrun on North of 60. I, I had people coming up to me still, you know, and saying, oh my gosh, you know, or whatever. And I had to go to the welfare office with my daughters. And I had to sit there with them playing at my feet, you know, with other indigenous people sitting in there who knew who I was, which, you know, was, was a while, that's just ego, it's whatever. But I was just sitting there and I, I was waiting for the social worker to come out and say, Michelle Thrush, can you please come into my office now? You know, and it was so hard for me and having my girls see me go through that, that pain. And so in my one woman show, I talk about that. And then I, I skip forward, you know, whatever, 15 years ahead of time. And I'm starring on a TV show called Blackstone where I'm playing a chronic alcoholic and I win a Gemini for this beautiful character and, you know, sitting in the audience while my daughters are watching with my mom <laughs> in Calgary on TV. And I'm waiting for my name to be called and they called Michelle Thrush. And, you know, I put those, those two together, but I mean, I've been in that place many times and it's not easy as, you know, as a, as a, an artist of color, it's been a long struggle to maintain any type of work that's been you know yeah it's been it's been a struggle that's been a struggle if I got one or two films you know roles a year that would be <clears throat> that would be good for me but that would be like you know four thousand bucks <laughs> or whatever, right? to raise my kids on so mm -hmm. I'm constantly having to hustle and and you know create shows and and do the, all the things I had to do to to get my girls grown up right thank you Joe. What, what an amazing visual to have those two moments in time up against each other. Yeah, amazing. amazing. Anyone else? Uh, I'm just I, not, you know, what's funny. I thought about this question. I was like, I'm not good at anything else. I don't know what else I would do. I thought about that many times. I'm like, oh, I should just go get a regular job doing what? Like, you know, I'm a clown. Um, <laughs> Yeah. You know, it's like I become a birthday clown. <laughs> Wait, I already am a birthday clown. You know, so. Um, um, but I mean, there's definitely been hard times. And I'd say even more so probably in the last few years. Um, because, you know, COVID and it's been a real struggle and trying to start a new business. Like we're not a new business, but we're trying to start the circus school and it's been really tough. And it was a lot. And um and you sometimes don't always feel supported by certain, you know, your board's not always, you know, they don't always have your, you know, they're just people who are volunteering and maybe don't have your best interest in mind. And, uh, you know, bless their hearts. I love board members. Don't get me wrong. But it's just sometimes you feel like you're like, I'll, I'll you know, I'll be honest. My artistic director salary for doing this for 30 years is ridiculously low, ridiculously low. I have to do gigs in order to survive. Right. It's like what you know most artistic directors of theater companies have been doing this for 30 years would probably be at you know at a you know, relatively up close to six digits but no i you know like it's i'm i have to take gigs 
So I still have to go out there and, as we say, put on the monkey suit and go out there and do that stuff. Um, and it's just more so in the last few years that I've been trying to go, okay, I need to realize that um, if I got hit by the lottery bus tomorrow, <laughs> who would replace me in oh. terms of what we're doing? And am I frozen? Sorry. Um, anyways, I think it's, I have always been, know that I want to be an artist, but sometimes you, you go, oh, this is a tough grind, you know, a tough grind um, for sure. But it's like, again, not losing faith, kind of hanging in for that next that next cool project and stuff. <laughs> and then things come to you eventually. Like now people are coming to us. You know, people are coming to us for stuff. And it's paid off. You know, the work, the time, the time put in is paid off. And so now we don't have to work quite as hard as we used to. But I always oh, tell young just... artists, too, about how you, you have to have such a passion and such a drive to do this work because it kicks the shit out of you. Like mm -hmm. it drags you down the road because there's times when, you know, you put your heart, whole heart in front of an audience, right? And you don't know how they're gonna react to it. And some might like it, some might not. And so it's a, it's a really tough business and you gotta have the ability to, to stick it out and not fall down every time someone rejects you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is true. Because when you when your art is kind of you, it's I mean, it's yeah. I'm sure it's it's certain for I'm sure it's very similar for visual artists as well. You yeah. know, your art is a separate entity, but when as an actor, your art is you. You are the you are the product, right? You are the product. And so yeah, so it it it, it is hard on the ego. I I know I know that that feeling. Yes, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, it's, it's very similar uh, for visual artists. You're putting something that's a part of you out into the world and you have no idea how it's going to be received. Right? Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and you, your livelihood depends on it as well. So, yeah, exactly. Thank you all so much. This has been amazing. And for me, Particularly, it was really just great to listen to the threads that ran across, you know, your practices and, and your careers as, as artists and some of the things that, that each of you touched on, you know, that came up along the way. So thank you. Thank you so much. It was great. Thank you. Um, I think that we're probably at the point where we will... A little break, but I will pass it over to Margot to uh, tell us where we go from here. We're just about 20 after eight or so. We can't hear you. You're very muted. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. I'm looking for that, that link to the uh, questionnaire. I had the oh. bookmarked and now I don't know what happened to it. So I can put that into the chat. But basically what that means is that we're gonna have a bit of a break. So everybody can have a, a breather, take a washroom break, go get something cool to drink. So we'll go for about about maybe 10 minutes and then come back and, uh, and answer questions if there are any. Okay. Okay. So be, when, when, while you're on break or just before you come back, we'll find that link and we'll put it in the chat box. Yeah. Just yeah. click on it and it's a it's just a feedback, short feedback questionnaire. Okay. Okay, cool. Thanks. We'll see, we'll see you in uh at eight twenty-nine. Yep. Yeah. Sounds good. Oh, there it is. I got it. Okay. So sorry about that. Okay, so the link is there. Let's see if it works. Yeah, it's highlighted. So anybody who wants to answer the question, even even you, the artists who are participating or speakers you can feel free to do the questionnaire as well 
So Mindy, we're just taking a short break. Yes, thank um, you, sorry about that. That's okay. Um, so we'll be back at 8.29. Okay. And in the meantime, Jill has put a link to our feedback form. So yes. you are welcome to click on the link and fill it out. Okay. Great time. And we'll see you in a few minutes. Great, thank you. Thank you. done through the, through the pandemic without without all of this 
Yeah. And you know, and in terms of the technology, we certainly embrace the technology ourselves. We um we produced a whole festival last year on yeah. Zoom. We did a whole yeah. you know month long uh, festival of circus arts and stuff, and we created. And we had a 30 day challenge every day. We had a new physical theater challenge and, you know, so we certainly embraced the technology and it actually got us into developing film work. We created Green Fools News, um, and released that last year, which was really fun. So doing puppet television. So it's, it's been good because it's been it's forced us to like experiment with new mediums and, and, um, and then to, to do puppet television and learn how the Muppets do things. That was hugely huge learning experience for me like massive just to see the scale that you can do this kind of thing at um yeah and it's also that's also put a fire in my butt to create more film here in alberta alberta based film creation because there's so many talented artists here and um fantastic so yeah yeah right on good mm. get some fireworks going off in your head <laughs> oh yeah for sure yeah, we're working on a, on a on a kids' television series right now mm -hmm. that we're going to pitch to CBC and all sorts of different places. So we're very excited about this. Great. Bravo. That is exciting. Okay, questions. Any questions? No. Actually, no. Mm -hmm. we, there are no questions um, that anybody wrote down. I think everybody was just busy listening. Mm -hmm. um, but we could certainly, you know, ask questions now and, you know, any of of you presenters feel free if you have questions for each other or questions for us fire away <laughs> well i i just want to say how much i love ear um what you guys represent and what you do and who you support because it is an un it's an un um sort of untouched sort of area of support that people don't think about because go oh, artists you live in the artist life you're doing Fine, but that you know sometimes people you know you get to a hard place and yeah you know or a health issue or something happens and i think it's amazing um and i did a i did a performance i think with gustavo at an ear event probably at least 10 years ago mm -hmm. um at the old ballet where the ballet or the opera used to be in that building that church um mm -hmm. and ear, it was an ear event and stuff so i've known a lot of the artists that have gone have worked through this organization and mm -hmm. And uh, I really love what you guys do. So it's it's great. Yeah. It's a, it's a labor of love for sure. So it's gotta be done. Yeah, it's amazing. I just noticed I have a question here. I think it's for me, I don't know. Oh, here's one, yes. Yes, Kestrel asked, um, Kestrel says, I'd really love to know how you go about pricing your work. Right. And Castro, were you to, were you referring to one of the artists in particular, or is that for all of them to to address? Well, I'm just popping my voice in. Um, several of you work in very different uh, ways, and as Dean knows, I am much more towards the performing side of it. I much more enjoy that aspect. But I also really love to see how people go about pricing their goods that you do pour your heart and soul into, as well as your shows, which is just you and a skill. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's always a big question. It, it's 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 actually agony. Yeah, a lot of the time it's like what what kind of value do you place on this? And we get and Dean, you already sort of had a bit of a rant about that, which was great, about how, you know, do not do not undersell yourself. Do not undervalue what you bring to, you know, what you're offering. So. Yeah. I mean, uh, there's certain, you know, for I'll, I'll give you a straight example, just to some simple numbers. For me, when I teach, uh, I charge $110 an hour. You know, uh, if I'm directing, I'll charge fifty dollars an hour, because it's it's a little less prepper. Well, you know, it's it's funny. We change these things all the time. You know, stilt walking. You know, we have a set price for stilt walking. We've come up with that. We base that on market. 
you know, that fluctuates a little bit, but sometimes like one stilt walking set for one performer might be $365, but maybe it goes down if you get more and we'll do like pricing that's based on the more you get, it might be a bit cheaper. And, um, and sometimes it depends on the con on, on the contract on the person. Um, for example, we just did a contract with the zoo where they came to us with X amount of money and we gave them X amount of puppets. Um, and so, you know, that, you know, we've, we've tried to create formulas. We have, you know, the fools, we have kind of formulas that we have created and those fluctuate based on market realities. We, we do, there is a little bit of that. There has to be sometimes like back in, you know, mid nineties, we were flush. There was a lot of people at that time we were getting, you know, $2,000 for one aerial performance. And now we'd be lucky if we can get $900 for that same aerial performance. So, you know, it fluctuates, it's weird. Um, but I'd say I, I, in visual artists, I, I have some artists that's like, I love what they say, I charge X amount of dollars per square inch. I know. You know I, and I think that, okay, whatever, whatever formula works for you that makes you feel like you're getting value. But one of the things that we do not do enough of as artists is value our own personal time. So, and people forget about that. This comes a lot when you have new companies coming in to the scenario and they undercharge, you know, they're a new young circus company and they're very eager and every penny they get in, they go back out to the artists. And when, when we started the Green Fools very early on, we said, okay, everything we do, there always has to be some going back to feed the mother. There has to be back to feed the the yeah. organization because yeah. so at, when it, we first started it was just christine and i and the green fools it would be three-way split we'd get a gig we'd split it three ways but there was always that notion of putting some money in and as eventually what that what that did was enabled us to hire a manager right we're like okay now we have a little nest egg we can actually hire somebody um but i would say you know i yeah that's so we you know i can give you some hard numbers but the reality is it can fluctuate a little bit also, sometimes, depending on the client, we will give them a deal. Um, but yeah, we've tried to, we, we, and we try to also incrementally increase those prices as well. And the reality now uh, in our industry is that we just recently came up against this in a, in a creation project where the expectation of an hourly wage has gone up substantially right now because people need it. They, they, cost of living is, is exp more expensive and so and there's a lot of movie industry and in work happening right now so a lot of the people that are in the creative building say like set designers stage builders carpenters they're all working in the movies and they're making 30 to 38 dollars an hour so i have to i have to be competitive with that so we have to try to pay competitive rates and that's tricky as well it's hard to adjust because it's not like our funding's going up and it's not like our rates are going up enough but you have to adjust so it's kind of a, you know, it's being aware of what's going on around you and what the, what the going rate. And we, as, as a company, we are very open with our prices. We talk to all of our other organizations, the other circus groups and people that do similar work and say, let's standardize. What do you guys pay charging? And we work really hard to try to standardize stuff for ourselves. we have doing that across Alberta with different stilt companies and different circus companies to understand what are you charging for a class? What are you charging for a class? And we try to all keep them in roughly the same place because why... Why compete against ourselves? We're all working for the same, you know, we're all, we're, we're attracting different audiences because of the work we do, but ultimately no one wants to undercut anybody or overprice themselves so then people won't come to their work, so. Mm -hmm. No, that's good to hear. I like the idea that you're, you know, communicating with each other and, and trying mm -hmm. to find a, a standard so that you're, um, yeah, and, and that actually, I think that adds another layer of, of um, credibility too, to mm -hmm. the fact that it, it and a professionalism. To... Yeah, and, and courtesies to each other too, right? Like, yeah. you, know, you don't want to be yeah. underselling yourself and, and, yeah. and killing your competitors. And um, at the same time, you don't want them to do that to you. So, mm -hmm. with, and, and what also what the market can bear, I think in visual arts, it must be different too, sometimes pieces yeah. can guard a much higher number well it, it's just speaking of that it, it's kind of a funny time um being formally educated through art school you were sort of taught that you know uh, your skill has to improve of course to sort of the value of said work your experience your craftsmanship sounds great um 
now with the selling of work online, a lot of new people coming out of uh, taking classes, um, sell work at a much higher rate. And I can see sort of caught in between two, two places where they see the value in what they do, but I see for myself that the craftsmanship isn't there. So why shouldn't I be paying that and more? Well, because <laughs> people purchase um, dead work here. So anyway, yeah, I'll, I could ramble on forever. So they're kind of teaching me at the same time as me being conflicted with art school, uh, what we were taught and how we were sort of I'm curious, I got a question for you, Mindy, just because I'm curious what's with the advent of online sales, you know, through all these different things, Etsy and this. Uh, like, I just know, for example, my, my wife gets beautiful pieces from India directly from an artist uh, now. Yeah. Because you can. Has that, has that lowered the overall cost of art or has that increased the cost of art? I wouldn't say lowered. I, I, I would think actually right now it's increased it interesting yeah yeah uh, having said that i mean there are always those that uh, not willing to want to pay that sort of price and that's fine mm -hmm. um, yeah it, it's it's an interesting time right now it's it's super popular right now classes are full to the board because i do teach as well as making my own work but people can't get enough of it right now and um yeah, people will start selling work right away. And, you know, each to his own. How about you, Michelle? Michelle, have you found any, have you, I'm sorry, Mindy, I didn't mean to. No, no, that. that's fine. No, no, it's all good. I'm curious with you, Michelle, just in, are, have you found that, like, I mean, Actra, your Actra, obviously, so that there's standard rates. Have you found that, that has Actra gone up over the, the time? Mm -hmm. um, are you finding you're getting more work these days because the industry is much more happening? Mm. Um. I think for film, like, because I've been at it for a long time and the awards and stuff, my, my personal rate has gotten really high in the last 10 years, okay. which is nice. Yeah. So it's, it's um, everybody's different and it really depends on your body of work and, and uh, your accomplishments and yeah yeah and i feel like i've got lots of stuff like i know for our community right now that it's so hard to book actors because everybody's for the first time in their lives are working non-stop and so yeah again it's that that payoff of all the investment we've done through the years of being starving actors and we're in we're the the flavor of the week i guess right now which is nice <laughs> So we'll, well see. It's not just for the week. I hope. I hope that it's uh, it's now the new norm. If you ask me, yeah. I really. I hope so. I I'm just being facetious time. right now, but yeah, but it's, it's a, time. It's time. It's time. It's, it's time. beyond time. Yeah, time. it's nice to not to just be offered, like through the years. It's always been oh the shaman role, you know, or oh here comes the um you know the Indian princess role right. and all that stuff. And now we're getting these really interesting roles because the 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 it, the indigenous the indigenous narrative has changed and there's there's this sense of sovereignty that's coming up finally and and we've been storytellers for thousands of years i mean this is something that's not brand new to us it's just right. now you've got a you know a camera or you know the stage yeah. and now you have indigenous directors and you have indigenous producers and writers i just worked with elmaya tailfeathers who's from uh, oh, oh. the Gaina reserve she's she just won two csas <laughs> You know, like there's just it's 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 a beautiful time, and there's an indigenous renaissance. And I ran into a non-indigenous friend of mine in the theater world, and it was so it was a weird thing because um, he was like, "There's no work anymore." <laughs> he said, "You know, it's so hard for a middle-aged white cis male right now to find work." And I'm like, "Oh God." <laughs> Really, uh, I'll see if we can hire you at 27. But it, you know, there was a part of me that felt bad. But then I'm like, God, this is not, 
you know, it, it shouldn't have to be like that. It shouldn't be jobs are taken because funding is going to a different project that has been ignored also for years. So it's just a strange time. I'm, it's a renaissance for, for, you know, for me and a lot of my friends, but it, you know, there's also a lot of artists out there that aren't getting work. And so that's why I guess I meant flavor of the week. It's, I also, I love that what you're doing, Michelle, in terms of Treaty 7 and that kind of stuff is you're, you're bringing, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're bringing, bringing the Indigenous culture and matching with sort of this westernized theater culture, but you're actually making work, you're making your own work and carving new paths. And that's, to me, that's why I love what you do. And I've always been admired what you do is because you just carve new paths. Yeah, yeah. We've got a new. I was saying a new show that's opening September twenty second at the Pump House that I'm, I'm directing and have sort of created. But um, this this show is actually going to be full on all Blackfoot actors for the first time, which is going to be really cool. Making Treaty Seven is very very known for our building bridges between communities, and we've done that very well through the years. And so right now, I want to just do an expression that is. It's about healing our families. And to me, that is my passion in life is using the arts to heal our people. Mm -hmm. So this, this new show that we're doing called Ogosi, it's, um, that means autumn in, the, in Blackfoot language. It's, um, yeah, it's coming up and uh, it's, it's uh, just a real, um, it, it's, we, we've got two non-native people in the band, so. <laughs> <laughs> Just to, you know, make sure they feel included a little bit. <laughs> a sequel opportunity, you know. <laughs> I, I find it in, interesting um, listening to you and because you've all been in your careers for a long time and this thing of honing your craft and honing your your skill and your, your techniques and so on, um, Getting back to the comment that Mindy, Mindy made, it's, it's an interesting phenomenon with visual arts because the online um, access to work has created this kind of strange phenomena where skill and technique is kind of starting to take a back seat because you can't the two dimension doesn't doesn't allow you to know that or appreciate that or experience that in a in a real tangible way and so you have you know artists who are posting who who have work available um you know after doing a course for a year and then you have artists who have this is their life's work and the pricing is the same, you know? Um, and so there's kind of an artificial inflation mm -hmm. happening because of the online phenomena that uh, I know I've had convers online conversations with several artists, yeah. like visual artists about, because it's, it's a really, it's a new thing. It's a new thing in the visual arts world. I, you know, I think the difference though is that, um, yeah, I, and I know young artists. I, I know some young artists who, you know, do some graphic illustration, put them on, and try to sell them for seven hundred, eight hundred dollars, and they might get them once in a while, but they won't last. They will yeah. not last because they don't have, they don't have the um, the discipline that having an art career gives you, having gone through school, having to learn to, where to start and stuff. So this happened you know and strangely it happens in my industry a lot where you have a lot of new young people who are excited and they go out and they want to start something and then they lower prices or yet yeah, maybe they charge more but what what ends up happening is they burn themselves up because they don't take into account things like your administration costs and your the time it takes and so there's a lot of this has happened time and time again where we get a little like oh those guys are taking all the work but you know what yeah give it a, give it a year they'll have spent themselves out they will have go oh well i just how much money i spent on shipping they do their math at the end of the year and go okay i sold all these pieces but then that cost me a thousand dollars in shipping plus all my they don't even calculate their time so i do i do feel like um 
that that's probably something that's probably always happened right. you know, a little bit. I mean, online sales is something that is is a is a is a, a viable means of making yeah. a living. I'm sure, mm -hmm. but um, I do believe that the proof is in the pudding. Like the work mm -hmm. difference when you get mm -hmm. something off. You know, oh, I got this beautiful artsy crafty thing, and you find out it's it's made poorly, and it's not really a, it didn't look like what it looks like, and you know, in this business, bad news will spread a lot faster than good news yeah. about the product. Very and true. I, you know, I think. Great God, thank you. Yeah, it's yeah. true. Yeah, and I'm not I'm not disparaging. I think, like, I'm so pro youth, pro young artists being positive and getting themselves out there. I mean, I've, I, I numerous kids that I've taught have gone on to uh, audition and go for work for Cirque du Soleil, but then when they came back, they had a whole different appreciation for the work. You know, they went, oh, I went to a Cold National Cirque for three years, and then went, oh right, that's why I wasn't getting any gigs because I wasn't there yet. I wasn't at that place in my career where I needed to be to charge the kind of money that I needed to charge. And so, you know, so, you know, there's that kind of thing about, well, you know, time and effort. And again, I don't want to, dis I'm not disparaging new young artists trying to make their way. But I don't think, I don't believe that our, that online sales will ever take the place of solid craft, of right. solid artistic yeah. craft. I'm actually in the middle of, of trying to um, well, learn as much as I need to do to, to um, create a website where I'm doing the print on demand thing mm -hmm. so I can bring in some money to yeah. help fund the stuff that I'm making by hand, <laughs> you know? Yeah. This is a great idea. Yeah. A great idea. Yeah. And also trying to sell some stuff that I make by hand too. So I'm trying to create a balance to go, okay, so this print on demand thing is really big. And once you learn how there's a lot of, there's a lot of possibility for income there. So I'm, I'm trying to tap into that. But when you're talking about like the business side of things, I don't have any brain. I mean, Rachel, you know that about me. I got nothing in my head as far as that kind of thing. <laughs> I'm really struggling with, with that. I'm, um, and um, I'm actually leaving one platform and going to another because it's completely not user friendly at all. Mm -hmm. But this one is so you know what I mean, you find what can work with the way your brain works. And um, might I and, if I ask what what platform that is? Uh, okay, the one that doesn't work for me is um, is called Square. It's like the same company that makes those. I, I shouldn't be saying this. This is going to be. <laughs> no, no, it's good. I think this is helpful information because a lot of artists will spend a lot of money experimenting with this stuff. It's good to know. They, they, yeah. need, to, they need to create um, a, a shipping profile that is more, that's more user friendly, that, that's easier to create. So I'm going back to, I might use that one for another reason, but not the reason I originally started. So mm -hmm. now I'm working with creating something on on big cartel because there's there's something much easier. I'm also looking into Shopify, but then they go, oh, hire somebody to help you to build your website, and and it shows all these places that you can hire and charge starting at three hundred dollars, six hundred dollars to hire somebody to do this for you, and I'm like, no. <laughs> do this myself you know and um and then you know the pricing and the whatever i think i think there's great potential there but you get into this and there is so much to learn so it's it's like cr trying to create a balance between still creating what what i've been doing for a long time the skills that i have honed over decades and also trying to adapt to what what is possible out there, what what is really riding a crest mm -hmm. of uh, energy on on the internet. And mm -hmm. and um, I'm 60 years old, so I'm trying to go. Okay, how do I work at this? You know, mm -hmm. um, yeah. My it's advice is don't do it yourself. No, hire a millennial. <laughs> it's hire yeah. a millennial. I know yeah. it's easy to say, but for us, like I realized a long time ago, was that there's no way that we can keep up 
to the the new and you know you have to have somebody who's got their finger on the pulse exactly and that's probably been the best, the best investment that we've done with the green fools is hire a mark somebody who does social media marketing yep. because yep. our online reach and are selling our classes yes. because they have online presence and our stuff is out there every day there's something being posted yes mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and i i was actually in a program that was helping with that but part of the program is gone now and there's another part to it where i had somebody that was supposed to help me and i had to set up an appointment and i can't even make an appointment for two more weeks so it's like ah mm -hmm. if there aren't even enough, enough of these people in the program to help everybody yeah. who who wants it so the demand is very high to establish these these skills and and mm. to, to find a way to use what what is um what's out there what's what's happening you know so, there might be some good concepts for uh for your as a as a support system you know yes. some of the work that yeah you know, there's yeah. probably, probably yeah. grants out there for this to to help yeah. artists um deal with digital media and connect digital media artists. Yeah. Uh, the Calgary Foundation uh, does that. Um, uh, uh, we had a, a, an organized, we got a grant to sort of connect us to that and to organizations that did a company called Technology Helped. Now, they, yeah. you know, I'll, I will say that, you know, they, they always want to push you down a Microsoft direction, which isn't always the best for artists. But, um, but I do think that that's where artists need support is, how do we market ourselves? Because we are, as I, like I said, when you are the, you are the product, you and your, the stuff that you make is the product. Yes. You don't actually have time. You don't actually have time to, no. to do that, to learn a new technology. I no. mean, I love learning new technologies, but you know, I'm going to design a website. I don't think so. I don't have time for that. I know. You know? I, I keep, I keep thinking I've got it all figured out and then I go, Oh, I just need to figure this little part out. And then I open that up and it's like months of the hell is this? So, yeah. And, and actually, I mean, I've been with ear now for nine years and whenever I look at, at what's, what can help me, I'm always thinking, how can this work for ear? So I'm thinking that with my experience that I've had and I want to find others who've done some, something similar, we can do something with this mm. as well. So totally. Yeah. Hey yeah. everyone. Yes. My daughter keeps texting me and she's not doing well. So I'm gonna have to jump off here and go back to nurse yeah. nurse okay. duties. Listen, no worries. Yes. Thanks so much, Michelle. Yeah. Thank, Thank you all. Thank yeah. you for taking Michelle, give Imagine my best. Please. Yes. Yes. Right, send her lots of love. Yes, please, okay. please send her best wishes from us as well. And thank you for giving us some of your time this evening, all of you. Oh. Yeah. Thank you. See you all. Bye bye. So much. Bye bye. So Mindy, we have Brambo Studio Online. Um, yes. Is there anything else coming up that you want to share with us? <laughs> Well, there is a little something Lisa and I have been working on. It's our Christmas in July. So on the 25th, right? Um, it's just up till Boxing Day, the 26th, and then it comes down. So it's just up for a couple days. And that's it till we figure out when that happens again. <laughs> like having a big sale? Of yeah. So we've got, we always do um, a few pieces of work that's our combined work mm -hmm. and then we'll also have some of our own work as well yeah can you can you write down the 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 address the web address in the chat because yeah. I'd, like I'd like to visit your yeah. check it out yeah okay yeah Steve, what's on the horizon for you um, well, we have just completed all these puppets for the Calgary Zoo. So if you ever go to the zoo this summer, you will probably see some of our large life-size puppets or larger than life-size puppets. We mean a life-size polar bear. We've got a giant great gray owl, whooping crane, a sage grouse. Oh, they're, they're live? They're like... They're like puppets. They're full and full life-size life, life -size puppets. Actually, larger um, than life. If most. you go to the zoo, they'll be roaming around or... Yeah, you'll see them roaming around. We've got we've got a great partnership with the zoo right now. Um, I'm on Fraggle Rock on Apple TV. So if you want to check out a bit of puppetry, I'm in there. 
bunch of our local Calgary puppeteers, and also a show called Joe Pickett, which is on Paramount Plus. Um, so some of my um, I've done some special effects puppetry on those shows. And what else have we got going on? Yeah, just summer is busy. We're doing a lot of festivals, and Green Fools will be everywhere this summer. So, so yeah, lots going awesome. on. Thank you. Good. Very good. Wow, that's that, that's mm -hmm. awesome. You guys are, I mean, all three of you are doing really well. It's it's great. No, oh, thanks. It's it's been a crazy it's been a crazy time. I really I have to say I really enjoyed the pandemic because it actually forced me to take chill at time and work in my garden because you know we don't normally stop no. it's like what's a weekend you know what's a weekend when you're working <laughs> yeah. for like, you know, we don't live normal lives we our lives are kind of what we you know kestrel yeah. knows she came in and it was part of our craziness she came down while i was teaching a, a physical theater intensive at the same time as making puppets that she ended up building kestrel actually worked on some of the puppets uh she worked on making some of the feathers for some of the puppets for the zoo gig so it's never stopped this today in fact was the first day where i didn't have anything to do and i had two naps never happens <laughs> yeah, Kestrel is asking if the green fools are coming to Ed edmonton fringe no, we will not be at the Edmonton Fridge this year. I'm sorry, Kestrel. Um, I'm a little too old for doing the Fringe anymore. But I would like to come up and maybe see it. So if I do come in town, I'll stay. I'll get in touch. I'd love to go see my daughter. She lives in Edmonton. So I might go up and see some pals. I was trying to get up there for Street Fest last week, but I was working on zoo stuff. Mm. So, yeah. We're doing a big media launch tomorrow at the zoo for the puppets that we're about to launch. So check oh, out the news good. tomorrow night. So. Will do. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. That was a really great chat. I wish there was more folks for you guys. That would have been yeah. great. Yeah. Well, I wish there were more folks for you guys because <laughs> you had so much to offer. Yeah. You were so generous with your time and your experience. And it's... Uh, thanks. Appreciate it very much. I had a great time. I learned a lot. <laughs> uh, me too. <laughs> have a good night, yeah, everyone. Good. You guys good too. conversation, guys. Thanks so much. Take care. Have a good okay. night. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Bye, Mindy. Bye, Bye Kestro. And leave. <laughs> wow. Wow. Once again, wow. a great discussion, and not enough people were here, but yeah. at least we recorded it. Yeah, we did. Well, it's recorded, which is yeah. great. Let me stop the recording.